Hey friends, thanks for joining me. I'm Dr. Sabrina Soltz, and today I'm going to take you through my carnivore and ketivore and animal-based pregnancy uh, and kind of where I've been from the beginning until about now, uh, which is I'm just in 26 weeks, so through week 25. All right, let's get started. So a little bit about me. If you're brand new here, you've never seen me before. You're just coming across my content. I'm a naturopathic doctor and I am a specialist in regenerative and anti-aging medicine. I have been a carnivore since January of 2022. Uh, through doing that, I actually ended up healing uh, IBS, anxiety, skin issues, chronic upper back and neck pain after years of trying so many other methods. I am currently 26 weeks pregnant with my third child. Uh, my first baby, my daughter, you'll see here in this picture, she, um, her, her pregnancy, her gestation period, she, well, I ate a very plant heavy paleo type diet, uh, where I was really aiming for like 10 or more plants per day. I also ate nuts, seeds, seasonings, everything. The only thing, things that I was really cognizant of was always keeping it low sugar and always, well, pretty much always avoiding gluten unless there was like some cross-contamination. And I was also avoiding dairy at that time too. My second baby, this little guy right here, his name is Zen. Uh, he was similar to plant heavy paleo, but there was more rice and seed oils in his pregnancy. Um, this is because I got pregnant with him kind of middle of 2020 when everything was COVID crazy. And I had actually just started my practice. So I'd opened my practice in October, sorry, March of 2020. So great timing, right? Everything worked out wonderfully, thankfully. But because I was so deep into working, running this practice, and I was a one woman show at the time doing all my own phones, scheduling, seeing the patients, all that stuff. Um, <laughs> it was very difficult for me to prepare my own meals. So I would eat at this restaurant a lot called Flower Child. If you're local to the Phoenix area, you probably know about it. At the time, I was under the impression they cooked everything in olive oil. Turns out they actually use grapeseed oil. I didn't realize that. So I found out too late, um, had a very, you know, again, seed oil heavy birth and pregnancy with him. Not good. Um, there's also a lot of stress involved again with owning the practice. I also couldn't exercise because all the gyms were closed during COVID. It was a rough pregnancy to say the least because of all of those factors. Currently with baby number three, this was actually just taken like last week or two weeks ago. Um, I am I fluctuate day to day between strict carnivore, more ketovore, or more animal based. And it really does depend on what I'm not what I have an aversion to or what I'm really craving at that point in time. All right. So what do I want to share with you today? I want to share with you my journey to becoming pregnant, what I've been eating and how it's changed through the weeks, why I'm actually eating this way, challenges I've encountered, physical activity I'm doing, supplements I'm taking, and then some postpartum and bouncing back commentary. Hope this is valuable for you. All right. So our third baby was a very, very pleasant surprise. Uh, November of 2022, I stopped nursing my youngest at about 23 months. And at that point, I hadn't had a menstrual cycle since March of 2020. I don't cycle when I'm nursing. It's just how my body does things. It just, I guess my prolactin that gets increased when I'm making milk, prolactin promotes lactation, uh, is strong enough that it actually does its job, which is shut down my other hormones to a degree where I don't cycle. This is evolutionarily preferred technically because nature says, well, if you're nourishing one baby, you shouldn't get pregnant with another one, right? No, no need for competition. So what happened was I must have went straight into ovulation as I ended up getting pregnant without actually having a period. So my uterine lining was about two years old when this happened, which is completely mind blowing to me as a woman, as a physician, as somebody who actually specializes in a lot of hormone replacement therapies. This was wild to experience firsthand. Now, because I hadn't had a period, we were kind of guesstimating when conception happened. And originally I estimated our date to be about December 18th. Um, this was based on data that I actually got from my aura ring. Um, and I had had a positive pregnancy test on December 28th. Interesting thing is that I felt pregnant way before that. I was like, I know something's happening, something's going on. And I had actually tested negative on December 19th. So I remember like going into my office that morning, it was a Monday morning. And I'm like, 
I feel pregnant. Like I just don't feel right. Like something's off. And I remember that day I had a negative pregnancy test, but turns out um, we just did an, an anatomy scan at the anatomy scan. I was measuring 25 weeks, which put our date of conception to Thanksgiving. So I was off by a couple of weeks, um, which can be normal. The way that we, the way that the medical system calculates pregnancy and timelines is actually really weird anyway. So let's say you are somebody who has a menstrual cycle. You technically ovulate almost mid cycle. And when they actually calculate how far along you are, they backdate it to day one of your previous menstrual cycle, which is two weeks off. So do I think the date of conception is accurate? Yes. And so do I think that if I would have actually had a period that I would have, that they it could say that it was that date two weeks prior to, I think that's right. So I think both are correct, Just, but again, it's just based on how the medical establishment currently calculates how long, how far along you are and whatnot. So this was me taking my double pregnancy tests because I really, I was like, I need to just double it up. I need to make sure we have to be absolutely positive. This is happening. Now, one thing that I do want to talk about is my meat aversion. So for nearly all of 2022, I ate a rare ribeye with butter for lunch almost every single day. In addition to other meals like bacon and eggs, ground beef, ribs, brisket, seafood, I kind of really didn't animal discriminate. The only thing I wasn't really into was chicken. <laughs> I come from kind of like a background in fitness and there have been way too many dry, boring chicken breasts in my past for me to actually willingly want to eat that currently. So I kind of don't really go for it. Now, January 21st was the first day I did not eat the steak that I brought to my office that day. And I know this because I have like the Uber Eats order in my phone still. I can see the past. And I actually ordered some sashimi, if I can get that, sashimi to the office because uh, I couldn't stomach the meat. Like I opened up my steak and I had like prepared how I normally do. And I was like, I cannot get this down. It was, I just couldn't do it. All I wanted was fish. So I ate sashimi a lot for probably two or three weeks um, until we went on vacation. It got expensive and it's it's like not sustainable to do something like that, really. Um, and at that point, I was also getting fairly bad morning sickness. It was just nausea, thankfully. I wasn't actually vomiting, which I am very, very grateful for. So what did my meals look like from January through February? Breakfast, I didn't really eat breakfast. I was simply too nauseous. I would wake up in the morning. It was hard for me to get water down um, and I did. I would do my best, but I was nauseous, really couldn't do it. Lunch, I was doing sashimi on days that I was at the office, but again, only lasted a couple of weeks, got expensive. Days that I was at home, I would have bacon and eggs. Dinner, I would do things like plain full fat yogurt, some fruit. I would poach some eggs and some bone broth. I would be able to do bacon. Um, I really wasn't eating any red meat at this point because I just could not get it down. Now, we did go on a nice vacation to Turkey and Egypt. My husband and I had this booked months before the pregnancy ever happened. Um, it was kind of like those once in a lifetime things that we took advantage of because we were going to have the opportunity to have my parents here to watch our children. So we're like, let's do it. Like, let's just make, make it happen. Um, I guess my husband's a very big kind of history buff when it comes to megalithic sites. So all the historical sites that have giant rocks, <laughs> right? Nerdy. I know I agree. Um, but so this is going to be kind of cool for both of us. I've always wanted to go to Egypt and, uh, we sent February 12th through 24th in these areas. Now, everything about this trip was super easy, except for the last five days. In these countries, you can go to most restaurants and get these giant meat plates of just mixed meats. And they usually serve them with like a side of tomatoes and cucumbers and rice. Like you don't have to eat them. I don't really want them. I can't do cucumbers anyway. Um, so that was just not, not a thing. Uh, but the last five days, we were on a cruise with no good options. It was terrible. There was only one buffet and the buffet only served food at specific times. There was no other options for getting food at all. When you left the cruise ship to go to the historical sites, you would go there with your guide and then you'd come right back. Like there was no room or time or space or opportunity for anything but what was being served on the cruise ship. Oh, it was so frustrating. So what I ended up having to eat was they had like these little yogurt, plain full fat yogurt cups at breakfast, and I would steal them and put them in the 
put them in the fridge in our room so that I would have something else to eat or something else to snack on. Um, and this is when I would, I would, when I was also eating some fruit, cause again, I knew it was safe. There was, I had to eat something. You don't not feed a pregnant woman. That's crazy. And then I would eat the meat that was there whenever I knew it was safe. So if I could be sure, or as least close to possible as sure that there were no seed oils used or any flours used to bread it or any like weird sauces, like not all of you know this, but soy sauce is actually contains gluten. I can't do gluten. It'll completely mess me up. So I just don't. Um, but yeah, if there's any like weird sauces, I kind of avoid it. And then the last two days of our trip, we actually both caught COVID, which was horrible. So this is my second time having COVID and COVID and pregnancy is a whole other animal. This was way worse than my first time having it. Possible reason for this is that my ferritin levels, which was my storage form of iron, were actually double what they usually are. So normally my ferritin hovers around like 40 to 50. Um, Prior to this, like I had labs done and my ferritin was up to about 80 or 88, something like that. It was, it was higher than normally was. Now this is important because COVID is a microbe that actually utilizes iron to replicate. So it kind of sucked those things up and there was plenty of it to do or plenty of it to use. So naturally I had a way worse time because it's like, yes, this is a great iron filled environment. Let's have a good time. I didn't. I got so sick. I could not eat or drink for two weeks. My fever was consistently about 103, 104 for literally days, like days and days and days of fever. Um, only things that I really could get down bone broth and the quick protein powders. And this, I saw lots of versions at this time. And then I lost my taste and spell and eggs would taste like rubber. Bacon was disgusting. It, bacon tasted like burnt cigarette smoke. Like I don't know how else to describe it. It was horrible. The only thing that actually tasted good to me was fruit. And again, I used the protein powder as, as well. As far as treatments, what did I do? I took some supplements that were safe in pregnancy, uh, like some vitamin C, some zinc, some N-acetylcysteine. Um, I also did an ozone treatment. The ozone treatment you'll see right here. Basically, what did they do is they draw some blood, about 60 cc's or a little more than that, actually. I can't remember exactly how much they pulled. But then they infuse it with ozone gas. They shake it up. That's why it gets kind of bubbly and bright. You can see in the picture over here. And then they infuse that back into you with the goal that it's going to kill off some microbes. And it wasn't until I actually got the ozone treatment that my fever finally broke and I was able to get into the healing. Uh, at that point, I had been fever straight for probably a week, almost 10 days. It was It was really severe. Um, then I also did some nebulizing of N-acetylcysteine at home, and this was to help my lungs. I was coughing so much. Even the residual cough that I had after that lasted weeks. It was really, really rough. So that was the COVID experience. Uh, it was horrible, but then this brought us to March and April of this pregnancy. So meals kind of shifted around here too because of the loss of taste and smell, the versions that I was still experiencing. Um, so breakfast, I would still not really be eating anything, but this did go away by the end of the end of March. Thank God. Now out for lunch, when I was at work, I would bring various, well, I'll call my ground beef bowls. I still couldn't eat or can't actually to, even today. I can't eat meat by itself. It has to have something else with it in order for me to get it down. Or I just won't. It's, it's really difficult. So the two bowls that I would really go with would be like my burger bowl. So I would do ground beef with chopped up bacon, avocado, and fermented pickles. Remember I told you I can't do cucumbers. I can't do regular pickles. These both really hurt my digestive system, but fermented pickles, because it actually removes the lectins, I believe, um, those I can do just fine. I'll also make meatball bowls. It's just ground beef with some homemade sugar-free sauce. So uh, my parents were here. Italian family. Uh, my dad did make us a whole big batch of some homemade sauce and that's what I was using. It had no sugar in it, no spices in it, all organic, about as clean as you can possibly get and made with love, which matters. The energetic imprint of it was very good for me. Um, and then I would put some Parmesan on the top of it, place it in the convection oven and it'd broil and it'd be a nice crispy top layer. It was delicious. Snacks, I would have carnivore crisps. I love them. I'll put a link below in the comments if you want to order them for yourself with a discount code. And dinner was interesting. I mentioned earlier that I don't really like chicken. 
but <laughs> I started getting really big cravings for chicken wings, probably because of fat content or something. Um, during this time period, I was eating chicken wings two to three times a week from beginning of March until about mid-April. It was a lot, a lot of chicken wings. Um, my husband thought he must, he must think that I was just crazy, like observing all this stuff, but sometimes you just have to listen to your body. And if that's, if chicken wings is what it wants, chicken wings is what it's getting. Now, of course they weren't like slathered in like crappy oils and stuff like that. Um, they were, they were very clean chicken wings, just, just chicken wings, but it was really helpful for me to have these. Um, and I would still also make my shakes with the equip protein powders or have bacon and eggs. Bacon and eggs have been a really, a true staple for me throughout this whole time. Minus during the time when I had the aversions in which the eggs tasted like rubber and the bacon tasted like burnt cigarette smoke. Super gross. Okay. So currently I can still not do any fatty cuts of meat. Like I was saying, I can't like, I can't do ribeye. I can't do New York strip. Um, this was a picture of the steak. My husband and I, the porterhouse that we ordered on mother's day at our mother's day dinner. And there's the filet side to it. And the New York strip side, I could eat the filet side just fine. I, I tried the New York strip side, couldn't do it. So for whatever reason, the fatty cuts of meat, the ribeyes and New York strips, I can't do, but I can do really well cooked brisket. So, and also ground beef. I can do ribs, the works. I've been on a brisket kick. We've been having at least once per week. We make it in the instant pot. My husband does, and he does a really great job. Um, I'll sometimes put a sour, small amount of sauerkraut on it. So this is where I kind of have like that ketovore stuff built in. Um, sauerkraut I can do fine with because it is fermented. It doesn't bother my stomach, which is a big thing for me with my history of IBS. And again, I still can't do plain meat. So sauces, condiments, these have all been things that have been really helpful for me at this point to just to get this stuff down because I ultimately want the nutrition that I know these food items contain. I'm still doing the equip shakes and I didn't mention this before, but the equip shakes are great because they are made from a beef protein isolate. So they're tolerable for most people that are able to tolerate beef, which is nice. For breakfast, I make something that we call the Zoe bowl. It's my daughter's favorite breakfast. Uh, and it's basically two over easy eggs, two slices of bacon, one to two tablespoons of goat cheese, about a quarter of an avocado. And I'll do this most days of the week. Um, I actually haven't had it. I actually had it twice this past week and this is Sunday. So it varies. Everything varies. Um, I'll have plain full fat yogurt a few times per week. I'll do either just plain old cow's milk from grass fed organic cows, but I also really like this goat yogurt um, that you see in this picture. Find it at Whole Foods. It's not cheap, but it's like super thick and creamy and the protein and fat content in it is really, really high compared to other yogurts. So when I'm doing like a cost benefit analysis in my head, um, the nutrition profile of that one is far greater, at least to me, if I'm looking at protein and fat content per serving than the cow's milk. So less carbs as well too. Um, it doesn't have like a goaty taste, like doesn't really taste like goat cheese. Like it's definitely like a shift from cow's milk, but it's, it's delicious. It's creamy. I love it. Um, and then I'll have random pieces of fruit if I know my body's like give me more energy and I want some something I want energy fast. Um, again, they're not necessary, but you know, the topic of carbs during pregnancy is interesting. I forgot if I put a slide in here about it or not. Maybe I did. But there is some research that that talks about how when like a mom being in ketosis and exposing her baby to ketones in utero, is not good for the baby and can produce all these other negative effects. And part of me wonders if that is in the context of women who are in ketosis due to starvation, not in ketosis due to eating a diet that supports that. Um, because ultimately I've tested my urine. I have been in ketosis at various times throughout this pregnancy. And as far as I know right now, some of the stuff that they, you know, say can happen cleft lip can happen, um, other issues like the neural tube not forming properly. None of those have obviously occurred. So hard to say, but again, I think it ultimately depends on if you are simply just getting adequate nutrition. And that's, I feel like is far, far more important. So let's talk about what about raw food and restaurants. Let me move this out of the way. 
So I've eaten a ton of raw foods this pregnancy. I know call the like pregnancy police because you have pregnant women are not supposed to eat raw foods because of bacteria. Um, I'm not afraid of bacteria. I'm just not. I'm just not. Um, I've eaten oysters almost on a weekly basis. I've had steak tartare, beef carpaccio. I've had raw cream, raw kefir, sashimi. These all go down really easy for me. And I really enjoy all of them. And I've had no issues. Not to say you should go do it. But if this, if these are things that you've like regularly enjoyed previously, maybe you continue to include them if it works for you. Um, now at restaurants. So we don't completely avoid restaurants. We don't love going to restaurants, but sometimes it might be one of the only options you have, or you have like an event to go to or people you want to see. We're not purposely antisocial just for the sake of adhering to diets. Um, but at restaurants, I'll usually order a burger without the bun. I'll add bacon or cheese or avocado if it doesn't already have it, or we'll do like seafood. And those are pretty much our staples. Um, we will also visit barbecue places and get things like brisket and pulled pork or ribs if we can be sure that the peep that like the restaurant that we know didn't like pre-marinate anything in seed oils. So that's what we do there. Let's go to the next slide. There we go. Cravings. Let's talk about cravings. We all get them. All pregnant women get them. Um, and I've had some really random ones. The very beginning of this pregnancy. I was craving like the crunch of iceberg lettuce. And at this point I hadn't eaten a salad in probably a, over a year. Um, so what I did was I got some iceberg lettuce and this is really funny. When I first went to the store to get the iceberg lettuce, like I really haven't bought lettuce in this like so long that I accidentally bought a cabbage first <laughs> and I got home and my husband, I like swore in the kitchen cause I'm undoing it. And I'm like, like mad that I got this damn cabbage. That I want nothing to do with raw cabbage is terrible. Um, and then I was like, I almost started crying because you're highly emotional that I didn't get the damn iceberg lettuce. And I actually ended up getting, going back and getting the iceberg lettuce. And, you know, I say all that because, well, I made taco bowls with it. I was like, I'll make a taco salad. Like that's going to be, it has everything else that I would normally eat, like the cheese, the sour cream, the ground beef, all that good stuff. Um, and then I'll just have iceberg lettuce and it actually ended up hurting me. So no bueno. We know that still doesn't agree with me. Um, now I also made a turkey club sandwich. That was a really big craving for me. You can see it in this picture right over here. This is actually homemade, like a waffle bread that I made with um, the carnivore crisps flour. And I'll link those down below too. Uh, this turned out bomb. So I did like the turkey, the cheese, the bacon, a little bit of like a healthy mayo. Mm, these were so good. They hit the spot. They satisfied that turkey club craving. And another thing that I craved is charcuterie boards. I've always been really into charcuterie boards. I kind of grew up with them, like being a big Italian family. My dad makes all these meats. Like anytime you see me posting about these types of meats, they're homemade. Um, and so it kind of reminds me of my childhood to have like the meat and the cheese and all the other things. And I did eat this one with apples because sometimes like that sweetness really adds to it. My favorite part about charcuterie boards is that every bite can be a different flavor if you really want it to. And I love that adventurousness about them. So charcuterie team for the win. Um, and then ice cream. Of course, I'm craving ice cream. We usually make our own. Like 99% of the time, we will make our own. And we just get heavy cream from the grocery store. We use egg yolks, a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of like monk fruit sweetener. Um, yeah. And we just cook it in our, cook it, make it in our ice cream maker and it's, you know, as clean and animal based as we can, as we can get. All right, let's talk about my current food intake. So breakfast, um, right now I'm usually only eating if I'm hungry and I'm usually having a Zoe bowl, um, lunch. I'm usually having ground beef bowls. So one of the two that I mentioned before, this is actually a picture of what my meatball ground beef bowl looks like once it's all like crunched up with the cheese. Oh, so good. Um, I'll usually, or I'll have an, a shake with the equip protein powder or leftovers from anything else we might've had the day before. Like if there's brisket leftover or beef ribs or pork ribs or anything leftover, um, dinner's usually same as lunch. Not a lot of variety here. I like to keep it simple. The less energy and effort and thought process that I can expend on my meals, the happier I am truly. Um, and then if I want dessert, or I'm still hungry later. I'll usually do like one of the yogurts that I buy or some of that ice cream that we make. Again, we only probably do that maybe a couple times a month. It's not frequent. Definitely not every week. Otherwise the kids would be going wild. 
All right. So why would we eat this way? I simply feel my best eating nutrient-dense animal products. Like this is the best I've ever felt in my entire life. And I want to continue this way. Um, as mentioned, it cured so many of my previous health issues. I don't want those to come back. And I feel terrible when I have too many carbs. I get sleepy. I get bloated. I get brain fog. It lights up my pain. And I also feel a little emotionally unstable. All undesirable. I would just rather not do it. So, oh, yes, I did put a slide in here about carbs. <laughs> okay. So real talk, there is no such thing as an essential carb, but they can be used strategically or because you simply want them if it's not in the context of a carb or sugar addiction. Now, I'm not here to tell you to follow certain rules or plans or dogma. Do what's best for you or as recommended by your provider. Caveat, if they're not full of shit, if they actually know what they're talking about. Um, now, personally, I choose not to eat a lot of carbs because of how they make me feel, but there have been days during pregnancy, maybe one or two times a week at the most, where my body is craving that extra fuel. And I'll honor that with something like a small orange, half a, half a banana, apple, or extra yogurt. And this actually usually promote, produces better sleep for me at night. So I track everything. I always make sure that I'm like optimizing for feeling, performing, doing my best. So I'll look at the stats on my aura ring and really say, okay, I ate this yesterday. How did I sleep? How does my recovery look? How do I feel today? And if those things are all in the positive, I think, okay, this is a good thing. But if they're not, I make adjustments as needed moving forward. And this has been arguably my healthiest pregnancy. So I'm going to continue listening to my body and, and doing what it needs or what it's, what it's pushing me towards. And everyone wants to ask, well, what should I eat or what should you eat? Whatever is working for you based on your goals, your versions, your cravings, your budget, and your time. And know that this may change week to week or even day to day. There's no rules. Like there's no, there's no one like, there's no like pregnancy diet guild that like sets these things in stone that like you're going to get lashings if you don't do them, right? It's all about just you. Like, and this is also not necessarily a time to micromanage your intake in a stressful way, but it's still a time to be as intentional with your choices so both you and baby can be as healthy as possible. You can bounce back. Like, you can have a really terrible pregnancy, and then you can get right back to how you want to eat, how you want to exercise, how you want to do all these things after the baby comes. You only get one shot to, like, gestate this baby. So do your best. Let's talk about challenges with pregnancy. So our challenges with eating a certain way in pregnancy. Number one, the biggest challenge is simply having those aversions. Honestly, just find an alternative that works for you. Don't add stress by aiming for perfection. There's no such thing. And ultimately, I don't believe something can be perfect if it causes you less joy. That's my benchmark. It's not perfect if the joy is less. Okay. Now that doesn't also mean that like, if you're addicted to heroin and heroin brings you joy that like you should continue to do that. That's not what I'm saying. It's that if you're trying to do the healthy thing, but that optimal healthy thing isn't quite working. Like for me, I can't eat my steaks, but I can do ground beef. It's good enough. And it's bringing me joy to like make my deconstructed meatball thing. Cool. If that's a win for me. Now cravings. When it comes to cravings, my rule personally is that I'm going to feed myself first and then I'll consider it. So I'm not going to just go right for the craving. I'm going to see like, am I just hungry or is this actually something that my body wants? So I do believe cravings are an intelligent piece of communication from the body. We should listen to it as best we can. But I also don't believe that like your body is deficient in hot Cheetos. <laughs> Sorry. I think that we can get cra like we sh ultimately we should be craving things that we know we need, whether it's like a nutrient we're deficient in, that we're seeking a certain type of food that has it or something. I don't know. But I don't think that craving crap is a real thing. I, I think that that's a lot of women just making excuses to eat whatever they want and like, hate me if you want for saying that, but prove me wrong. <laughs> prove me wrong. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my opinion on that. Again, take it or leave it, but that's yeah. Okay. Um, next thing, nothing available. So if you're in a situation where there's nothing that you can have or nothing that you want to eat, you're maybe at a restaurant, you're maybe traveling, you're in an airport, something, do the best you can. 
going back to the first point, the stress is not worth it. You will recover from a few bad meals, but don't make it a a regular occurrence necessarily. Eat what you got to eat, get full, do whatever you got to do, move on. You'll be fine. And sickness. If you're sick, recovery is your number one priority. And if all you can stomach during the sickness is like sourdough and broth, who cares? Eat what you're going to get down. Worry about it later. Just recover first. Now, arguably, eating a really healthy diet is going to help you recover from sickness even faster. But sometimes sustenance is just simply sustenance and energy that your body can extract from something is going to be the best option. Do what you got to do. Let's talk about weird stuff that's happened to me during pregnancy because, well, it's never been a walk in the park. Um, (laughs) The first one. So one of the cool things about going carnivore was that I deodorant really became optional for me. I no longer had any weird stinks or weird smells. And then I got pregnant. Uh, And now I have one stinky armpit. My left armpit is the bad armpit. My right armpit's totally fine. And maybe it's just me because when you're pregnant, your senses are heightened. It must not be that bad because my husband lost his heart. He has never said anything. And my son, my two-year-old keeps trying to like lick my armpits. I don't know what's going on there. If I'm giving off some sort of like really motherly pheromones, but it's weird. It's just, it's just so weird. Um, just this morning in the bathroom, I'm getting, standing there getting ready and I'm putting on deodorant and he goes, mom, I want to lick your armpits. And I'm like, geez. So I don't know if anybody else has had like a kid that has had that like weird thing. If you have, let me know, tell me I'm not alone in this. And if I am, oh, well, um, but yeah, I've got one stinky armpit. I've also got one really large breast. My right breast is probably at least 50% bigger than my left one, which is super odd because when I was nursing, my left one was probably 70% bigger than my right one. So they like switched off. The other one's like, it's my time to shine spirit fingers. And it's just uncomfortable. Like I just don't like, I don't know. I've also got more fat on my arms and my legs than I'm used to. And all of these things are likely due to higher than normal estrogen levels. My body does not like high amounts of estrogen. Like there, I've done my DNA analysis and like, I naturally tend more towards an androgen preferred state my body doesn't do well with estrogen. Some people do. Some people like really thrive in a higher estrogen environment. I think these are the women that just like love being pregnant. That's not me. It's not me. I'm sorry. I don't love being pregnant. I don't love this high estrogen state. I don't love these changes that are happening. I love the kicks and the growing baby. And I actually love giving birth and I love nursing. Um, I don't love pregnancy. So yeah, the estrogen can kiss my ass, my growing ass and my weird boob and my smelly armpit. Thanks, estrogen. Moving along, let's talk about exercise. So exercise, I have been in the gym to some degree since high school. I did four fitness competitions back to back while in medical school and completely wrecked my metabolism. Would not recommend that for anyone, whether you're in medical school or not. Um, But that is another story for another time that I should probably share. Currently, I am most concerned with simply being strong and functional. That's it. I'm not trying to put on any, any more mass. I'm not trying to look a certain way right now. I am just strong and functional because I want to, I am training for childbirth because man, that is a marathon that takes a lot out of you. And then those, those weeks postpartum, like I'm training for that. So that's my goal. Currently I'm working out anywhere from six to 12 times per month. And this is just due to my work schedule and my personal preference. I don't like working out on days that I have to work because I feel like it takes energy away from me performing in that way. So I usually do not work Friday, Saturday, Sundays. And those are usually the days that I do go to the gym, get my workouts in. Um, yeah, that seems to work for me. So I would exercise while pregnant. Honestly, if you can safely do it, do it. If you have to double check with your physician or midwife to make sure that they clear you for it, but like do it. Um, now again, this isn't the best time to try to put on muscle or gain strength due to the increased need for hyper intentional nutrition and recovery. You're already growing a human, which is a very highly demanding anabolic state. You don't necessarily need to add 
more to that unless you plan to be super dialed in with your nutrition and recovery. It was going to be super easy to throw yourself into um, increased inflammation for one, breaking down muscle causes inflammation, but also nutrient deficiencies as you try to both build a human and rebuild your own tissue. So also remember to be mindful regarding core activation. So no coning of your abdomen and any bearing down movements, um, especially in second and third trimesters. So like standing squats with heavy weights on your shoulders. Ultimately, it is generally safe and encouraged to do whatever you were doing pre-pregnancy while you're pregnant. Now, postpartum, like please do not do any exercise until you are cleared. This is usually at least six weeks, okay? Now, postpartum, you're going to have an internal wound like the size of a dinner plate that needs to heal or you can risk bleeding out. Take this seriously. Once that placenta detaches from inside of you, the size of the placenta, that's the like wound that comes out. This is why we women bleed for six weeks afterwards. Take it easy. Okay. There's no rush. Now, light walking will almost always be a good idea for most women, especially after meals to help with blood sugar management if you've eaten carbs. And if you need to hire a trainer who has experience working with pregnant women who can ensure you are doing safe and effective movements, because now is absolutely not the time to get injured just don't do it. Safe, effective, safe being the first thing. All right, let's dive into supplements. Honestly, I barely take anything. Um, at the beginning, I bought a one month supply of prenatals and to this day, 26 weeks in, it's still over halfway full. I suck. Yeah. The only things I take somewhat regularly are Oyster Boom, which is actually uh, my product. Um, and I'm not just saying that, like I truly do believe in this. Like there's a reason that I made it. Um, and it's because there's nothing really that does it. Like it's such a really potent mineral supplement. It has other nutrients in it. It's just great. I'll put up a link below. I love it. Um, so I'll take those that in the morning and I'll take a Quinton, which is another mineral supplement, um, mainly for hydration and whatnot. Um, and then in the evening I'll take some magnesium melatonin and I'll also sometimes take a cortisol manager, which is another supplement. And again, I'll link all these below so you'll have access to them if you want to take a look at them. My goal is to curate my diet to be as highly nutrient dense as possible, but I'll also go by instinct. So first trimester, we have these like B vitamins that I buy my husband and they're a liquid. And I used to thought like the smell would make me want to gag. Like I would be so nauseous and <laughs> I actually found these enjoyable during pregnancy. So clearly my body was like, yeah, take this in. We need this. You actually like it now. And before, like, I wouldn't even kiss him if he had taken it recently because I could, oh, it was so bad, just so bad. But now it's fine. I don't mind it at all. So here's what I'm not saying about supplements. I'm not telling you to not take anything. Um, this is just what's working for me. Please do what works for you. And if needed, get labs done to assess for common nutrient deficiencies. So things like D3, B12, folate, zinc, copper, selenium, magnesium, and iron. These are really common things that can get depleted that are also very essential for you to have in your diet. So again, don't just copy what I'm doing. Um, Cause I'm doing what works for me. I want you to do what works for you. And I also spent the year before this pregnancy eating a lot of red meat, eggs, and dairy. So I really feel like i built up my nutrient bank, so to speak. Um, so I felt pretty good about not necessarily needing to supplement a lot of these things. All right, let's talk about other pregnancy things. Let me move this out of the way. Okay. So testing and ultrasounds. I have opted out of like 90% of this as I personally didn't feel it was necessary. Like I said, we got the anatomy ultrasound done just because the midwife that I want to have at my birth is requ she required it to make sure she wasn't kind of walking into any big surprises. I get it as a medical provider. I wouldn't do anything that I didn't do my due diligence on first. So I get it. Um, I also pulled some labs on myself. Like I mentioned earlier, those will be ready soon. I think I mentioned that earlier. Maybe it just was in my head. Um, I did a urine test. I mentioned that because I talked about the ketones. That's pretty much it. Now I am planning to do a home birth. This was my second one. I did one with my son. It was like the best thing I ever did. Uh, truly like my daughter was born in a hospital with an epidural, like it's the whole, that whole experience, my son at home, water birth, no pain management, nothing. I would a thousand percent pick that over hospital birth, like every single time, every single time. Oh, so good. 
Um, I did do hypno babies prior to that. Truly, I didn't even make it through the full program. I maybe did like a third of it because I am one of those people that really loves starting something and never finishing, calling myself out there. Um, but it seemed to have helped. Um, but also the other thing that helped me with childbirth that I was like able to be cognizant of in the moment was cold plunging. Now, this isn't something you can start doing if you're already pregnant. It's something you would have had to have done before. But the it's such a transferable skill to do cold plunges and then to jump into childbirth because what you're training your body to do is stay calm and breathe through really intense pain that feels like you're dying. And it works. Like I, I just remember being like, oh, wow, this is very similar to how I would breathe and how I would try to get myself to relax when I would cold plunge. And it was just like, duh, like, of course, of course, this makes sense. It's all about your nervous system, your mindset, how you're controlling slash surrendering to things. Like that's the other trick with cold plunging. You have to just surrender to it. Like you're in it. You're not getting out of it, right? At least, I mean, you could, but you're like being comfortable with the surrender, being comfortable with the pain and knowing you can get through it those were, I mean, those are lessons that you really only get by doing, which I think is why a lot of women fail out of their home birth attempts or they end up going to the hospital or not going through with it because man, it is more of a mind game than anything. Truly. I really commend women who do home birth the first try their first time. And just like, you're awesome. I mean, any woman who does home birth, any woman who births is awesome. You're awesome. Whether you birthed However you birthed, if it was a C-section, if it was home birth, like you're awesome because you're awesome. And that's all there is. You just, you just are awesome inherently as a human. You are awesome. You never stop being awesome. Okay. I think I said awesome enough. Moms are awesome. <laughs> all right. Let's talk postpartum a little bit. Um, let's talk about the placenta. So I'm not going to be consuming it. I know some people do. I know it's like a trendy thing, especially with people who do like home births and with midwives. I don't believe in it. I don't think it's necessary. Um, I think it's like hardcore when some women just like eat a raw piece of it. And if I'm hemorrhaging, I might do that. We'll see. Um, but I am going to be banking the umbilical cord. Now, I'm not going to do like the traditional umbilical cord banking that like you see pushed in your doctor's office because I kind of don't believe in that. I think it's a scam and it's bullshit. <laughs> this might be another topic for another time. Um, this isn't to like make you feel bad if you did opt for that because they have really, really great marketing and they have really great sales. And I only know what I know because I have been in the stem cell industry for a very long time. So again, my knowledge base is a little bit different, but I've never previously opted to bank any of my children's tissues. This time I am, I'm using a company called Vital Cells. Um, I'm planning to actually do more content with this company and kind of like partner with them a little bit. So there'll be more of that coming actually next week I'm filming with them. Um, so there will be stuff coming out on that, why I'm choosing them. But if it is something you are interested in, um, let me know in the comments and like, I can do a whole other section on like cord blood as an industry cord blood as a scam and what you should be looking for instead. Cause that is his whole own topic. Truly. Um, I'm going to be focusing on rest and recovery. I am um, on what I'm calling my maternity leave slash sabbatical, where I'm really just focused on supporting my staff in like the running and the operations of my clinic that's still currently fully operational. Um, but I'm personally not going to be seeing any clients um, or patients or anything for until I decide. Really, that's really it. I originally I was telling myself, oh, I'll wait till the baby's six months old. I don't know. Could be sooner, could be later. I'm just going to go by how I feel when I feel like I've gotten enough rest, recovery, and mom time. I also have two other ones. So three kids is going to be a lot. <laughs> um, I'm going to plan to eat a lot of food because I actually feel like it helps me bounce back better. And we'll talk a little more about bouncing back too. Uh, and then I'm going to do nursing. Uh, so my goal is to nurse for about two years and then do some baby led weaning with that. All right, let's talk about my bounce back. I show you these as an example of why I think what I do works because I have ultimately gotten healthier despite having multiple children and multiple pregnancies. So May, 2017, I was about four weeks pregnant with Zoe. Um, I still had my breast implants at this time. Those got taken out in 2020, um, December of 2017. This is me 38 weeks pregnant. 
And then May, 2018, four months after giving birth. So pretty good as far as like getting back my body. Um, and again, still had implants at this point. Don't miss those whatsoever. Best choice ever. November, 2020, it looks like I have implants, but I don't. It's just massive breasts growing from all the estrogen in my system. Um, I had actually gotten them out in March of 2020, but this is me 36 pre weeks pregnant again. So I'm actually way bigger at 36 weeks. You can see, um, compared than I was at 38 weeks with my first did not bounce back well after this. Remember I was eating a lot of seed oils and not able to work out. So I had a lot of kind of extra fat sitting on my body at this point. Um, this was May, 2021. So six months postpartum, but then we fast forward to July of 2022, which was me about six to seven months into carnivore, 19 months postpartum, leaner than I ever was prior to that and feeling healthier. I mean, you guys can't see, like there's no physical representation of the internal stuff that was happening. Like you can't look at a picture and see my gut issues or see my anxiety um, or see my chronic pain. Like you can't. So I show these pictures to show you like there was a physical change that happened that was very positive. Like I, like I said, I did four fitness competitions. I would work my butt off to look nothing like this. Like I would, I wish that I would have like had that when I was on stage and I didn't. And then I got this just doing carnivore kind of effortlessly, which was really cool. So I'm planning to obviously go back to that so that I can I felt my best. I looked my best. It was just, it was really good. It was obviously healthy enough to get me pregnant for the third time without even having a menstrual cycle. Like picture that my uterine lining was strong enough, just eating all that good food to be able to maintain this next pregnancy without having shed for two years. That's pretty like, so again, you can't see my uterine lining in here, but I promise you it's powerful. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Um, but let's talk about for a second, like why women hold on to excess fat in the first place. I have a whole fat loss program that I'm actually in the process of redoing. Like I said, I'm not doing, a, I'm not doing work seeing patients, but I am doing stuff in the background to just like provide more content for people. Um, but in that program, I teach that there are only three reasons, only three, why your body's holding on to excess fat. And once we solve for or correct these three reasons, your body will release that excess fat. It's that simple. So the first reason is that your body is simply storing excess fuel. You're like, well, duh. But where this becomes tricky is that, well, that could be because you're either overeating, you're undereating, or you're not eating enough of the right stuff. So this becomes very Goldilocks. And this, again, we teach, I teach this in the program how to dial this all in. Also, your fat is an endocrine organ. So there can be hormonal concerns causing you to store excess fat. So these are generally related to things like cortisol, estrogen, insulin, testosterone, and also leptin. I forgot to put that one in there, but leptin is a big one too. And then the third reason is that your fat is a storage place for toxins. So if you've had a lot of toxic exposure to things like environmental toxins, heavy metals, mold and mycotoxins, or even just crappy food, and your body can't accurate, like can't keep up with the demand of eliminating it, it's just going to tuck it away for now. Think of it like a landfill. So these are the main reasons why, which is why like when I went carnivore and I was able to really get as lean as you saw in that last picture, all these things were corrected for by being on that diet, by doing all the things like it just, I loved it. It worked really well for me. I'm not saying everybody has to do it or it's going to work perfectly for everybody or that you need to be on it forever and ever or that you shouldn't cycle out of it. I'm not saying any rules about it. I'm just telling you this worked for me and it worked in that way. And that's why I love it. And I can't wait to go back to it once my aversions, cravings, all the other stuff with pregnancy is going away. So I know this was a lot of information. Um, if there's demand for part two, possible other things that I might cover um, was I recently did some labs. So I might do another video breaking down my results and kind of telling you guys, teaching you how I interpret them. I might do a possible video about weeks 26. So kind of what I'm going through now through the birth. I might do a video about birth story. If that's something that would interest you guys as well. I might talk about my bounce back plan. Once I, how do you know I'm going to have a plan or if I'm just going to go back to doing what I know works for me. Uh, but ultimately if these topics or, or pieces of content are things that would interest you, let me know. Um, would be happy to make that. I, I actually love making content. So let me know. All right. So where to find me? Obviously, if you're on this channel, if you're subscribed, I'm going to make videos that I'll post here. 
Um, my husband and I also have a channel where we do topics together, where we're teaching on various things. I'll drop that below as well. You can find me on Instagram at Dr. Soltz. Uh, the clinic that I own is called Stem Cell Therapy Professionals. You can find us online at stemcelltherapypro.com. We practice regenerative and anti-aging medicine. There's options if you are local to Arizona or not. We do it for people virtually. Uh, like I mentioned, time of recording this plus a time postpartum, I will not personally be seeing any new patients or clients, but my staff is amazing. They are all trained in my protocols, my methods, my ways of doing things. Plus they obviously, of course, have their own unique gifts and talents and insights and whatnot. So you absolutely will have the best care should you decide to work with us. All right. Well, I hope that you guys found this informational. If you enjoyed it, let me know with a thumbs up. If I earned a, a subscription, go ahead and subscribe and we'll talk to you next time. Bye.